Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Ceylon College of Physicians uh, monthly specialty update. So as has been the custom this year, we partner each uh, month with a sister college. And this time it is uh, a very new college, the Ceylon College of Critical Care Specialists, uh, who will be conducting, uh, their members will be participating and conducting this uh, specialty update in collaboration with this. We are very glad to have uh, Dr. Dishan Priyankara, President of the Ceylon College of Critical Care Specialists with us today. He will uh, introduce the speakers and take you through the session. So thank you very much for being here. Before I wind up, I'd just like to remind everybody that the Ceylon College of Physicians uh, annual academic sessions commences on the 2nd of uh, September and runs for three days, the 2nd, 3rd and the 4th. It's a joint session with the Royal College of Physicians of London and the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. So I look forward to seeing you there. It's a virtual conference given the current lockdown situation, but uh, it is also free for all the PG trainees who register through their PGI email address. So I look forward to seeing you all there uh, participating. It's a very interesting session with a lot from COVID and a lot from things other than COVID as well. So thank you very much. I uh, will hand over the chair to, uh, uh, to Dilshan to take over. Good morning, everyone, and uh, I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of uh, the Ceylon College of Critical Care Specialists. And I would like, especially thank, would like to thank uh, the Ceylon College of Physicians for giving us this opportunity and arranging such meetings. Uh, so this is, the, the month is dedicated to the uh, critical care specialty. So today we have uh, four. Um, uh, Talks basically now we are. Uh, I, I know we, everyone is uh, busy, during, especially during these days, especially during the pa pandemic of COVID. But we thought uh, now uh, we we will be discussing uh, certain topics which are slightly related to COVID, but also we would like to you know uh, <clears throat> discuss certain things that you you know uh, which are really important in day-to-day uh, -day, uh, critical care practice. So uh, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Nuan Ranavaka, who is a consultant intensivist at the National Hospital of uh, Sri Lanka at the cardiology uh, unit. And he's going to talk to us on uh, target therapy, the phenotypes in sepsis. Now we all you know targeting therapies. Now we are going forward uh, towards looking at uh, individualizing therapy. So I think, one will have uh, certain things to uh, enlighten us on this topic. Over to you, Nuan. Good morning, uh, everyone. And thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you very much for the Ceylon College of Physicians uh, for giving us the opportunity. So today, uh, we are going to discuss uh, how we have learned uh, from uh, the uh, pandemic of COVID. And then how are we going to infer these uh, the, uh, things we learned to our management of uh, sepsis in the future. Let me share my uh, slides. Yes. So how we are going to phenotype sepsis and uh, how we are going to uh, uh, apply those phenotypes in the management of sepsis in the future. When it comes to uh, social perspectives, there are a lot of things we have learned from the pandemic of COVID. Though the everyone uh, highlights the importance of non-discrimination and it is well known that, and as well as it was told by the pandemic that everyone is not treated equal during this uh, period, similar to a war situation. And on the other hand, um, even though it is said that uh, the viruses don't discriminate, actually they do. It has been shown in this study that there are three clusters of uh, uh, patients. When it comes to immunology, when, the, uh, when they are uh, affected by the COVID illness. So this cluster uh, has shown uh, reduced uh, B cells and reduced immunoglobulin levels. And there's another cluster which has shown uh, reduced T cells and high uh, cytokine levels. And there's another cluster, third cluster, which has shown 
that uh, there are higher level of cytokine levels. It has been uh, highlighted in this uh, 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 image as well, the cluster one, uh, B lymphocytopenia uh, with hypergabaglobinemia and cluster two, reduced T cells with high uh, uh, cytokine levels and cl cluster three with higher level of uh, complement levels. So in this study, it has been shown that uh, the, uh, the people study have got the same level of uh, uh, the oxygenation level in their body, which is uh, marked uh, with the marker here, pointer here. The one group has shown, the blue group has shown higher level of inflammatory markers like uh, CRP, ferritin, D-timers, WBCs, lactate, all are high in that group compared to the other class. And most importantly, they have got, the higher inflammatory group have got higher cytokine levels. And most importantly, they have got higher mortality rate, which may be significant. And not only that, when it comes to lung function of the patients who have got COVID, there are two classes have been uh, demonstrated, the class L and the class H. Even though they have got the, uh, the same oxygenation levels in the body as shown in this picture, you can see the class A, the class L, the difference between the class L and the class B, even radiologically, sorry, class L and class H radiologically. If I explain it a little bit further, the uh, class L or the type L, the lungs, the patient, lungs of the patient have got low elastance, that means high compliance with stiff lungs, sorry, uh, reduced uh, stiffness of the lungs. And in their uh, imaging, they have shown the ground glass appearance. On the other side, the uh, type H have shown uh, higher elastance and me that means reduced compliance with stiff lungs. In the imaging, they have shown the uh, alveolar edema with higher lung weight. It, it was important for the therapy as well. The class L, the type L, uh, will be treated or will be managed with the uh, usual uh, ventilatory uh, settings. Whereas uh, the uh, class H will, uh, should be managed with the ultra low level of tidal volumes and the, with a higher P to protect their lungs from the uh, injuries. And as well as they may need a higher uh, level of recruitment maneuvers and prone positioning. So you can see that depending on the phenotype, uh, we may have to adjust the, uh, our therapy as well. And on the other hand, there has been an interesting phenomena which has been demonstrated in the immunomodulation of COVID-19 patients. That is what we use commonly as atosolizumab. And there have been multiple trials uh, in the past uh, period uh, to check the, to assess the efficacy of atosolizumab. You can see the early trials uh, where they have uh, tested tocilizumab were all negative. But the recent trials like Impactor, PremapCap, and Recovery, though, those trials have shown the, uh, the outcome benefit and the mortality benefit of tocilizumab in COVID-19 patients. And one important factor which they have demonstrated was the usage of steroid. Now, early trials, the reduced, uh, rather low proportion of uh, study participants have been treated with steroid in addition to tocilizumab, like 4%, 10%, sometimes 40%. But these positive trials, uh, the study pa participants have been treated uh, with uh, uh, steroid almost all the time. 
So in this impact types, 80%, remap cap, 88%, and recovery trial, 82%. So there are two inferences we can think of. One would be uh, the synergistic effect of tocilizumab with steroid. So that could be the reason that these uh, particip uh, participants of these trials have shown uh, the uh, positive outcome benefit. On the other hand, uh, it has been shown as in the previous studies that higher inflammatory markers, higher inflammation of the body uh, showed the higher mortal rate, which has been suppressed by uh, the steroids in a generalizable way, in addition to the tocilizumab. That could be the reason that uh, uh, the more positive benefits are there with reason more stress. And in fact, if we go into the uh, uh, detailed analysis of each trials, like uh, remac cap trial, which has shown the outcome benefit of tocilizumab, have actually shown uh, the higher level of CRPs in their study participants. You can see it's more than 100. 50s, 130s like that, and higher D-dimers and higher ferritin levels. The reason would be that they have included uh, the patients with critically ill who have got uh, uh, the respiratory support and uh, the vasopressor support in the, in the ICUs as the study participants. So the phenotyping, uh, getting involved those uh, uh, higher, the critically ill patients with higher inflammation would be the uh, reason for them to have a outcome benefit uh, with, with positive survival uh, improvement. And uh, in the uh, sub-analysis rather, uh, 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 rather outcome analysis of uh, this, uh, uh, this data in the, uh, this uh, remac trial, they have shown that higher the CRP, higher the benefit of giving tocilizumab. So uh, that will indicate that selecting out patients with higher level of inflammation into uh, the specified treatment, which should uh, benefit uh, them most. So how are we going to infer these uh, results into the management of sepsis in time to come. As you all know, the sepsis, which has been, uh, which has been uh, defined as uh, life-threatening organ dysfunction uh, caused by dysregulated host response to infection, uh, that definition is a very broad definition. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the surviving sepsis campaign have bundled the uh, therapies uh, into a sepsis bundle like machine lactate, the uh, taking cultures, antibiotics, uh, and uh, crystalloids and vasopressors. Up to date, the only therapy which has shown the outcome benefit is giving early antibiotics. Nothing other than that. The one reason uh, could be that applying the therapy broadly into a very broad category of patients, uh, therefore the cancellation of the outcome between each other. So does phenotyping uh, help uh, this problem? And as I said, this is the uh, inflammatory reaction when it comes to sepsis. And for me as a simple person, this is not different than this picture. So how can we uh, solve the problem? There have been an interesting study uh, conducted uh, with Seymour et al. Uh, about phenotyping patients in sepsis. And they have used an interesting uh, methodology as well. Actually, what they have used is artificial intelligence. So in the methodology, what they have done is, uh, they have used uh, kind of 29 uh, uh, lab, uh, clinical and laboratory markers, and they have fed the data into the machine. 
and that's all and let the machine decide uh, how to categorize uh, these data into groups without any supervision by the trialist. So the machine have categorized into four phenotypes of sepsis, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And you can see the uh, clinical manifestation is also nicely uh, categorized into those uh, uh, four phenotypes by the machine itself using artificial intelligence. Uh, these are the uh, phenotypes, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So when the trialist went back to analyze uh, those uh, uh, subgroups or phenotypes and to check how the machine have uh, 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 categorized those uh, patients into those groups and they have found that alpha was the most common phenotype and they have got fewer abnormal tests and least organ dysfunction. And most importantly, they have got uh, lowest mortality rate. Whereas beta category included older patients with chronic illness and renal dysfunction. And the gamma category uh, shown higher level of inflammation and pulmonary dysfunction. And most importantly, the delta category uh, which is the least common phenotype, which got a higher level of liver dysfunction and shock, have shown the highest in hospital mortality rate. And interestingly, they have uh, re-evaluated the uh, cytokine levels among those categories, and they have shown that the, there's a kind of a significant difference of cytokine levels uh, among those categories, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And it is clarified uh, more in detail in this picture when it, compa when, it, uh, uh, when it compared in alpha and delta category, you can see the alpha category, low level of cytokines and inflammatory markers, whereas delta category, you get higher level of inflammatory markers and cytokines. Now, how does it uh, relate to uh, mortality uh, data or the survival benefit? What uh, the trialists uh, have done is uh, they have uh, used uh, the previous trials which have shown negative results like the process trial where the early goal directed therapy uh, was evaluated and which resulted uh, as there's no significant difference and they have categorized uh, the, uh, the study participants into those uh, four phenotypes, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and recalculated the, re-evaluated re the, the trial data and found that the, uh, the delta, there's a significant difference of mortality between those four groups. So here, higher level of mortality in the uh, delta group, whereas lower level of mortality benefit with the alpha group. So it has given up hope. And not only the, uh, the uh, process trial, then they have used a progress access and other trials and shown that there's a significant mortality level, mortality difference. So this has uh, uh, give us a hope which uh, on which we can phenotype our patients of sepsis in time to come. And then we'll be able to use our therapy, especially the immunomodulation and other therapies for the treatment of sepsis. And we'll be able to demonstrate higher level of outcome benefit, which may have not been shown in the past before. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nuan. Uh, that uh, for that very short and uh, interesting lecture. So we'll be looking at phenotypes in the future. I think we'll entertain the questions at the end of the, uh, the session, uh, the whole session. So I would like to invite uh, the next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Anushka Mudalige.
who is a consultant intensivist at uh, Colombo North Teaching Hospital. And uh, she is going to talk to us uh, about a pill for lungs pharmacotherapy for ARDS. Over to you, Anushka. Thank you, Dilshan, for that nice uh, introduction. And uh, a very warm thank you for the CCP for giving us this opportunity to present on this uh, prestige forum. And yeah, I was given the topic of uh, talking on ARDS. So it's uh, it's kind of the topic or the fashion of the era or the decade, we can say, since uh, the pandemic of COVID came up. And uh, But um, since everybody's been talking about COVID and ARDS, I thought of talking about the conventional ARDS that we've been managing up until 2019. And uh, so it's a little different, but we'll go through and see what kind of pills are available for ARDS. So um, I, I thought of starting what is uh, ARDS. Uh, so in, uh, it was in the 1800s, early 1800s, that what it, it was really uh, like identified as a new syndrome with pulmonary edema without heart failure. And then there have been uh, several nomenclatures like uh, double pneumonia, shock lung. And uh, it was actually 1967, that uh, the phrase acute respiratory distress syndrome was uh, introduced. And it was at this point that it, ARDS was identified as a distinct clinical uh, syndrome that involves both lungs. From the definition came the criteria in 1994. This was introduced by the American European Consensus Conference. And uh, they introduced uh, four criteria. That is, uh, there should be an acute onset and uh, there should be bilateral lung infiltrates. There should be no evidence of uh, elevated left atrial pressure. In other words, there should not be a left ventricular failure. And the arterial oxygen tension, that is the PaO2 you get from the blood gas, divided by the inspired oxygen fraction, commonly known as the PF ratio, should be less than 200. If it was less than 300, they said it was acute uh, lung injury and less than 200 ARDS. Then in 2014, 12, sorry, uh, it was uh, redefined, the burning criteria came up and uh, they defined the ARDS as uh, they gave a, a definite time period from a known insult within one week, there should be new onset or worsening of the previous symptoms uh, within that week. And there should be bilateral opacities in the chest imaging. This could be either through X-ray or CT. And the PF ratio, uh, they increased it to less than 300. And uh, the, at that moment, the patient should be on a PEEP of five or more than five. Um, and also they said uh, it should not be fully attributed to cardiac failure and or volume overload, but it can coexist with these two conditions as well. So with that definition, we are now, we have defined ARDS. So, um, According to that definition, we have an incidence of ARDS worldwide, but these are from the Western world of 4% to 15% in ICU. Now, uh, the mortality, it's uh, quite high actually, it's from 22% to 45%, the 45% being in uh, the most severe ARDS. And the patients who do survive, the ones with severe ARDS will require long-term rehabilitation because the damage that is being done to the lung is uh, it's kind of permanent. And they have uh, reduced functional capacity yeah, at one year's follow-up. So before we talk about the treatment, let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology. This is, um, so the, there should be an injury according to the definition. That injury could be direct lung injury, that is uh, maybe a pneumonia or inhalationary injury or drowning or an indirect injury, uh, maybe trauma or pancreatitis, again, burns, and which um, initiates a, a inflammatory process. The hallmark is there is a leak of the capillary membrane. So there are two membranes, as you might remember from our basic sciences, that is the capillary endothelium and the alveolar epithelium. Both get damaged and there's a release of cytokines. There's a cytokine storm. And this will call in for more neutrophils to come in and release more proteases, uh, reactive oxygen species into uh, the surrounding. So on, the, on, uh, on your uh, right side, you can see the healthy lung, the alveolus and the capillary. So the alveolus, inside the alveolus, there's air. 
and the membrane is covered with uh, the type 1 epithelial cell and there are some type 2 cells as well which secrete the surfactant which is seen as a white uh, uh, layer on top of the cell which maintains uh, the whole uh, the homeostasis the water does not get in and the surface tension is maintained within normal and there's a macrophage which engulfs any bacteria or any foreign body that comes into the lung and uh, there's the protection. There's a small gap between the alveolus and the capillary, which enhances oxygen delivery and well, as well as carbon dioxide excretion. And there is a capillary with a good blood flow, which again enhances good gas exchange. Now on the other side is the ARDS lung. There has been an in, uh, injury and the macrophage has got activated and it is now shooting up all the cytokines into the lung. This will cause chemotaxis of neutrophils. Neutrophils will leak from the capillary into the uh, alveoli, and it will now start secreting other uh, enzymes, proteases, and oxy uh, antioxidants, which will go and damage the membrane. So the type one and type two cells will die off. The surfactant is no longer there. The sodium potassium pumps will start dysfunctioning, which maintains the sodium balance and thereby the water balance inside the alveolus. So water starts flooding in to the lung. The surfactant is washed out. And uh, you can see there's water being exudated into the interstitial space. The gap is now increased. So oxygen delivery will get impaired. And also there are changes in the capillary. The endothelium gets swollen up and there are platelets getting aggregated and there are microthrombi being formed. Also, you might have heard of a phenomenon called the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction because there's less oxygen coming into that capillary, the capillary will start vasoconstricting. All this will lead to an increased pressure in the pulmonary vasculature. So all in all, oxygen delivery will be impaired and carbon dioxide excretion will be impaired. So the natural history of ARDS goes through these two major stages, that is the exudative stage and the proliferative stage. Initially, there's edema, as I explained earlier, there is water flooding into the alveoli. This lasts about three days. And with that, the cell's membrane starts breaking off, which shows on uh, histology uh, specimens as a highly membrane, which starts about one or two days after the insult, peaks around four days, and then slowly goes down. And at the same time, the proliferative stage starts around the, the fifth or seventh day. That is, the alveolar uh, cell starts regenerating or it repairs itself. At this time, the macrophage will, starts, uh, will start uh, forming fibroblast as well. So in some patients, this fibroblast will uh, be overwhelming the system and causing fibrosis on the alveolar membrane. So this is uh, the uh, exudative phase of ARDS, as uh, Nuan also spoke earlier. There is a, uh, quite a bit of con con congestion on the basis of the lung, whereas the top of the lung is more aerated and the middle part is now, uh, it's, it's the salvageable lung, where there is some water as well as air, and uh, that, that shows as the ground glass appearance. So apart from the things I've mentioned, there are some uh, vascular permeability increasing agents that are also secreted. They will also secrete so many uh, mediators that will cause increased permeability. And I already ex explained how pulmonary hypertension occurs. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the proliferative phase, the resolution of the pulmonary edema occurs here, and there is uh, proliferation of the type two alveolar cells or the lung regenerates along with the uh, new fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. There's a new matrix de deposition. This starts early and lasts for more than seven days. So if you're lucky, the lung will come back to its normal state. All the water will be reabsorbed and the lung tissue is regenerated and your CT is back to normal. But in some patients, as I mentioned, they will end up having fibrosis. As, as you can see on the bottom CT, there are, there are fibrosis in the interstitium as well as the alveolar. So these patients will have um, prolonged hypoxia, uh, increased ventilatory dependence, and also increased mortality and reduced functional, uh, functionality uh, in the long run. So now since we talk about the pathophysiology, let's move on to pharmacotherapy according to the pathophysiology. So if you remember what has happened or in that pathophysiology, the first thing is there is inflammation. Even no one talked about it. There's a massive inflammatory process. 
So if we can stop that inflammation at any point using some kind of a drug, maybe we will be successful. So the drugs that have been studied here are the steroids mainly and uh, N-acetylcysteine, mac mac macrolides, simvastatin, that is statins and uh, neutrophil uh, neutralizing agents. Or we can reduce the edema or the water being filled up. That is by giving surfactant or something to activate the sodium potassium pump, that is a beta adrenergic agonist or salbutamol. Or maybe we can give less fluids and draw up that fluid out. The other thing is we can, uh, there was vasoconstriction, pulmonary vasoconstriction. If we can vasodilate, that might also help. So nitric oxide and phosphocyclines are those drugs. And there are microthrombi formation in the pulmonary vasculature. So if you can stop that, maybe giving antiplatelets or platelet activating factor inhibitors, that might help. On the other hand, the lung regenerates at the end. If we can enhance that process by giving a, a growth factor, such as keratinocyte growth factor, that might help. So those, these are the theories. Let us see how it goes into practice. So this is also in the pictorial form, all uh, those drugs acting at the various pathophysiological processes. I'll just give you a few seconds to go through it. it it's, I already explained this. Okay, so first we'll talk about how to reduce inflammation. So if there was one drug associated with ARDS that was causing much havoc and uh, debate, it would be steroids. The first paper that was published on ARDS was in 1967. As I said, that was the time that word came up, ARDS word came up. It was from uh, David G. Asherberg et al. And this paper was published on the Lancet. And if you see the abstract, even in that first paper where they mentioned ARDS, they have mentioned corticosteroids marked in red. It has appeared to have a value in the treatment of patients with fat embolism and possibly viral pneumonia. So they appreciated the role of steroids even at that time. So since then, there have been a great deal number of uh, research being done on steroids. So these are the early ones. If you can see the timeline, this was from 1979 to 1986. So they've been using various types of steroids. But initially, it was mainly methylprednisolone given at uh, various regimes. And the outcomes, well, they have different hours. Some said that they, uh, the outcome was better and some said there was more infection and some said they cannot give a definite recommendation. And moving on to the more recent uh, randomized control trials from 2006 to up to 2020, we have changed our steroid therapies like from moving on from methylprednisolone, we have uh, tried hydrocortisone and dexamethasone. So various regimes have been tried. And again, the outcome, the outcome mortality benefits, some have shown, some have not. Ventilatory uh, free days, some have shown, some have not. ICU stay and hospital um, stay, again, there was no robust evidence. These are some meta-analysis and systemic reviews, uh, which have been done and well-powered. Uh, if you uh, can see, there, there are over 500 patient, patient uh, clusters in each um, uh, meta-analysis. Still, the evidence did not uh, give a um, definite uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, what, uh, so they have used different uh, regimes for different uh, causes of ARDS. They did find that uh, the, uh, the benefit was more on bacterial pneumonias and sepsis and uh, pneumocystis cherovachi, whereas the side effects or uh, the adverse effects were more if you give it for viral uh, pneumonias, like the SARS, the MERS, the viral uh, clearance was less when you have given um, steroids. So the confusion was so much so that in 2016, this. Giacomo Berlini did this study over the all five um, uh, continents of the world in over 50 countries involving 500 uh, ICUs. And uh, they, they uh, studied the practice of ARDS, the treatment modalities on these ICUs on uh, ARDS. And when it came to corticosteroids, they have studied 2,377 patients, only 425 of them had actually received corticosteroids that came up to one in five. 
So the use of steroid was very much doubtful at this point until the pandemic came up. So then came all these trials. You must be knowing, I'm not going to go through the recovery, the remap cap, the codex, Cape COVID, and there are so many other trials. They are randomized control trials, uh, well powered, uh, they say, and uh, it has actually shown mortality benefit and uh, uh, organ uh, support uh, free they benefit in these trials and from for the covid pneumonia now it is kind of a must to uh, administer steroids but in the conventional ARDS we still do not have uh, uh, enough evidence to practice steroids so we'll move on to the next drug that is statins so statins theoretically would work but there are some trials, but these are the hallmark trials, the HARP2, uh, the top one, and the sales. They were done in 2014, randomized control trials. Statins were given to one arm and not to the other. And they compared the two arms. And unfortunately, there's no mortality benefit according to HARP2. And the sales was actually abandoned due to futility. So statins have no role according to these studies in uh, ARDS. The other anti-inflammatory is n cysteine We use it as inhalational agent uh, in some of our patients, some even IV. There's a meta-analysis. There are other studies as well, but this meta-analysis, uh, having six studies, well-powered, showed no benefit in mortality. And further research is required before strong recommendations can be used. So that is for information. Now let's move on to in the, uh, reducing edema. Beta agonists, as I said, the beta agonist will act on the sodium potassium pump and will reduce the edema. And it also has an effect of reducing the pro-inflammatory, uh, releasing pro-inflammatory uh, mediators into the lung. So there are two trials. This is the BALTI-2 uh, and the ALTA trial. The BALTI-2 trial started uh, trial, the intravenous beta-2 agonist, whereas the ALTA trial uh, tested on aerosolized uh, beta-2 agonists. But uh, the IV trial actually showed harm in using it. And uh, it was not recommended to use IV uh, beta-2 agonist. And aerosolized uh, salvitamol that does not uh, improve clinical outcomes. Again, for mechanically ventilated patients, it is not recommended. So beta-2 agonists are uh, out from the picture as well. The other one is surfactant. So surfactant is lacking in ARDS. So what if we can give it artificially? So this is another meta-analysis, meta Sang L et al. Uh, published this on eight uh, trials that were done from over 1994 to up to 211. And as you can see, there is no uh, effect or mortality benefit by using surfactant. So the next one of reducing uh, fluid in the lung is by reducing fluids. So this is actually a breakthrough trial. The fact trial, which was done in 2006, uh, along with the ARDS net uh, trial uh, series, where they uh, divided the two patient groups, one into having restrictive fluid, the other one into normal fluid regime or liberal. And although the 60-day mortality outcome was not different between the two, they actually showed that the duration of mechanical ventilation and the intensive care stay was reduced significantly. So from actually we now, uh, as practitioners who uh, treat ARDS, go for a restrictive fluid management when managing uh, uh, our conventional ARDS, which is not the same for COVID uh, pneumonia, but this is for ARDS. Then the next uh, arm would be to promote pulmonary vasodilatation. So nitric oxide is our vasodilator. So there have been many studies uh, published in the chest in 1995 uh, and here uh, again in 1998 and another uh, uh, randomized control trial in 2004. So over the uh, decades, it has been going on these trials, but none of them actually proved that there's a, a, a mortality benefit. They actually had a reduction, uh, the reduction in the pulmonary artery pressure when you measure it by invasively. And there was an increase in the pulmonary artery oxygen tension, but it did not cause a reduction in mortality. 
So the other drug uh, group is prostacycline, ileoprost. It's again a vasodilator. So you can use it as an inhaled uh, uh, agent. And they have trialed this in 2015, the CHEST trial of uh, using inhaled prostaglandins. And in the Cochrane Library, there is a meta-analysis on aero aerosolized prostacycline uh, used for in the purpose of uh, causing pulmonary vasodilatation. But again, these trials did not show any robust evidence of using uh, prostatizacline to reduce mortality. Maybe again, there is a rise in the PaO2 and a reduction in the pulmonary artery pressures, but it did not reduce mortality. So we'll move on to the other arm. That is the coagulation, really, uh, stopping the coagulation uh, pathway of uh, formation of microthrombi. So aspirin. So this is a review article. There have been so many articles uh, with regards to aspirin as well. This review article uh, compared the studies that have been done so far. And as you can see, there are most of the studies, if you're on your left uh, side, is, is they are prospective or retrospective or observational studies. The only study that was there as a multi-center international cohort kind of a uh, study and uh, was well powered, 3,855, the topmost study but it showed no significant reduction in ARDS in the patients with, uh, who are taking aspirin. And the, all the other studies were, which were um, uh, not randomized controlled trials, they, some showed benefits, some did not, but at the end, they, they were not powered enough to make a strong recommendation of using aspirin in the current context of management of ARDS. Platelet activating factor inhibitors. So, uh, the trials regarding these uh, drugs are more in uh, towards of uh, finding uh, how much of platelet activating factor is inhibited in the lung. And they have actually shown clear, uh, in the laboratory device that the platelet activating factor inhibitors are actually, if they are reduced, the platelet activating factors are quite high in the lung when there is ARDS. But by giving it artificially, this drug, the recombinant platelet acti activating factor acetylhydrolase, uh, it was well tolerated, but the, uh, the evidence was not strong enough to make an recommendation to manage in ARDS patient. So PAF inhibitors also do not have a strong recommendation. Then the last bit, the lung regenerates at the end, so can we enhance it? This is by giving a keratinocyte growth factor. So these trials, which were published in the American Journal of Respiratory Care and Critical Care Medicine, they actually studied the amount of keratinocyte growth factor inside the lung. And they actually showed that it is very much reduced. So that would indicate if we can give it artificially, maybe it will be helpful. This is the CARE study, a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial, uh, which was uh, carried out uh, in the late uh, to, uh, 2017, actually. But by giving KGF, it did not improve physiological or clinical outcomes. Although it is reduced by artificially giving uh, the growth factor, it did not improve the outcome. Then, uh, neuromuscular blockers, they do not fall into any of those categories that are mentioned earlier, but this is a breakthrough trial, the accuracy trial, which was uh, published in the New Journal of Medicine uh, in 2006, said that uh, use, uh, they divided the uh, two groups, one into uh, using atracurium or muscle paralysis for 48 hours and the other one not using muscle paralysis. And the adjusted 90 day survival was actually better in the group, significantly better in the group that were paralyzed. So since then, in the, this was um, the, the, the inclusion criteria was moderate to severe ARDS. So since then we've been actually using muscle paralysis in moderate to severe ARDS. Even now we use paralysis in ARDS patients, even in COVID patients. But then came the ROSE trial about uh, two years back. This trial again did the same protocol that is one arm was paralyzed, the other arm was not. But the difference was the arm that was paralyzed had very deep sedation, whereas the other arm had very light sedation. If you work in critical care, we always tell too much is too bad. So we always try to minimize everything. So too much sedation is always bad. So 
maybe it is because of that, because the mortality in this trial, or although it was kind of identical to the initial accuracy trial, showed more mortality benefit in using muscle paralysis also. So the only that being been, been using is also being uh, told that has uh, it's been told that has no effect on our outcome, but still we use uh, muscle paralysis in moderate to severe ARDS. So I've been talking to you all this so through the all these slides and all these uh, research and uh, to tell you the correct pill for ARDS. So what is the pill that will cure ARDS? We'll go back to our basics. So these are the two stages of the lung during ARDS. The lung gets injured. It goes into an acute inflammatory process that will impair oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal. And then the lung will heal by itself. None of the drugs that we give will enhance this or stop this process or uh, enhance the healing. The only things that have proven benefit of course, treat the cause. For as for any other disease, you treat the cause so the lung can heal. Then you give a break to the lung. You let the lung rest for a while till it heals. So that would be for moderate and severe days, you might have to ventilate these patients. But during that ventilation process, you have to make sure that you do not cause iatrogenic injury. You do not cause barotrauma, volutrauma, atelectrauma, biotrauma. You do not over distend the lung. You just let it rest until it heals by itself. So these are low tidal volume, target uh, low pressures inside the lung and prone ventilation. These are proven they are, through randomized control trials. These modes have been proven to uh, improve mortality. Also fluid management, as I said, restrictive fluid management and good nutrition for the healing process. And ECMO, it's this extracorporeal mem uh, membrane oxygenation, which lets the lung rest completely. The total oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal is taken over to another machine and the lung is kept to rest so it can heal by itself. So in severe ARDS, when the PF ratio is less than 80, ECMO has proven benefit, mortality benefit uh, in ARDS. So in summary, ARDS is a heterogeneous syndrome with variable severity and underlying causes. Researchers have opted to explore variable pharmacological therapies depending on the pathophysiology of the disease process. However, there are no promising agents yet to be accepted as recommended therapy. A personalized approach with lung protective ventilation and supportive care remains the mainstay of management. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anushka, for that uh, very concise uh, uh, lecture. Uh, so we're going to move on to the next uh, talk. Uh, we done by Dr. Chamin Virasekar, who is a senior lecturer and a, a consultant intensivist at uh, Teaching Hospital Karapitiya and the Faculty of, of Medicine Karapitiya. And uh, so he's going to talk to us on uh, right ventricular failure, a forgotten aspect of hemodynamics. Over to you, Chamin. So thank you, Dr. Dilshan, for the kind words of introduction. So before uh, coming into my uh, topic, first I would uh, want to draw your attention to a case presentation just to highlight the importance of acute right ventricular failure and the knowledge about it in terms of managing patients. So this is a 60 year old patient, male patient who got admitted with classical symptoms of pneumonia. He was hypoxic and hemodynamically unstable. He was tubed and ventilated. And over the next uh, day, the chest X-ray showed that there was evidence of full-blown ARDS. So according to the uh, ARDS net protocol, patient was ventilated with lung protective ventilation. And in terms of improving oxygenation, he was given high PEEP. He was hypotensive, which was treated with fluids and vasopressors. The oxygenation improved and the FIO2 was reduced in the next couple of days. However, there was a significant requirement in noradrenaline. So at, as part of the care in ICU patients, we do bedside echoes as intensivists. And the bedside echo showed a dilated right ventricle and a tapsy of 
11 millimeters, which I will come into later, the TAPSI shows that the systolic function is impaired. And there was no tricuspid, tricuspid regurgitated jet. And in the parasternal short axis view, there was septal flattening. Patient's plateau pressure showed that it was 30 centimeters water and the peep was 15. So the peep was reduced to 10 in view of the impairment in right ventricle. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide was 60. And in view of clearing carbon dioxide, the respiratory rate was increased from 12 to 16. And after the interventions, the repeat echo showed reduced septal flattening and improved TAPSI. So this case shows how impairment in right ventricular function can have a detrimental effect. Now, most of the people, most of the intensivists, physicians, or almost everybody pay a lot of attention to the left ventricle. If you look at the echo report, most of us will be interested in what's the left ventricle injection fraction. Or like nine, if you take 100 people, 100 doctors, 99 people will look at only the left ventricle injection fraction. But as this case highlights, right ventricular function determines a key role in critical ill patients. So with this background, within the next 20 or 25 minutes, I would be talking about the anatomy and physiology of the right ventricle, assessment of right ventricular function, something about the pathophysiology of right ventricular dysfunction, about right ventricular dysfunction, the classification of origin, and approach to right ventricular dysfunction. So first of all, I would like to draw your attention to a few anatomical facts. So as you all know, the right ventricle is coupled to two pressure systems. You have the systemic venous return, and on the other side, you have the pulmonary circulation. Both are low pressure systems. And the right ventricle, shares the septum with the left ventricle. And it is said that the interventricular septum contributes up to about 40% of systolic function, which is a great extent. And when you compare the walls of the right ventricle and left ventricle, the left ventricular wall is obviously thicker to withstand the greater systemic pressures. And regarding the blood supply, the right coronary artery supply is the right ventricular free wall and posterior one third of the interventricular septum. So this is, then I would like to, now I would like to draw your attention to your physiology days. So this is the pressure volume loop of the left ventricle. Classically, even in exams, we are questioned about the pressure volume loop of the left ventricle, isn't it? It is rarely that we would be questioned about the pressure volume loop of the right ventricle. So if you appreciate the differences between the pressure volume loops of the left ventricle and the right ventricle, it's obvious that the left ventricular pressure volume loop is rectangular and the, the right ventricular pressure volume loop is much more triangular. Another fact that you could appreciate is that during filling, right ventricular volume increases with very little increases in pressure. And the right ventricular isovolumic contraction phase is of short duration. So these are very important aspects in the right ventricular pressure volume loop. Then something about the normal right heart pressures. So I told that the right ventricle is connected to the systemic veins and the pulmonary, artery, pulmonary system, isn't it? So as you can see, the numbers say that the whole system consist of low pressure, especially the right ventricle. The systolic pressure is 25 compared to a systolic pressure of 120 in the left ventricle. So because of these reasons, the right ventricle will tolerate pulmonary artery pressures, pressure changes poorly. For example, if there's a rapid rise in the pulmonary artery pressures, the right ventricle will not be able to withstand it because of the anatomical and physiological reasons. But however, the right ventricle can accommodate and react appropriately to changes in volume. Then I would like to draw your attention to the concept of ventricular interdependence. 
So ventricular interdependence is the function the, and, and the anatomy of one ventricle depends on the other ventricle. So in the normal heart, as you can see, I, I told that the right ventricle and the left ventricle share the common interventricular septum. So normally the left ventricle is cross, uh, circular in cross section and the right ventricle is crescentic shape. But in case of right ventricular failure, what happens is the right ventricle could dilate, but it happens at the expense of the ventricular septum being pushed towards the left ventricle. So what happens is the left ventricle, the volume will in decrease as a result of that, the there will be less left ventricular filling during diastole. And according to the Frank Starlin principle, the stroke volume or the cardiac output will reduce, re resulting in reduced systemic perfusion as well as both reduced coronary and right ventricular, reduced uh, left ventricular and right ventricular perfusion because of the reduced coronary perfusion. Now let's move on to the proper topic, acute right heart failure. So right heart failure could be acute or chronic since uh, as intensivists, acute right heart failure patients are more commonly seen and more relevant for us. So that because of that, this reason, I thought that I would discuss mainly on acute right heart failure in the interest of time. So it is defined as a rapidly progressive syndrome with systemic congestion resulting from impaired right ventricular filling and no reduced right ventricular flow output. So when you talk about the pathophysiology of acute right heart failure, the causes of acute heart, acute right heart failure can be divided into two broad categories. It could be either due to increased right ventricular pressure overload or decreased right ventricular contractility. So this graph illustrates that the right ventricle is unable to withstand increased offload. When you compare the left ventricle, the left ventricle will be able to withstand the increased overload because of the big muscle mass and the higher pressures generated during systole in the left ventricle. But in contrast, in the right ventricle, when the afterload increases, there will be a dramatic rise in the stroke volume and the stroke work will also increase. This is very important. And this slide shows the concept of interdependence. So in uh, the right, in the uh, left side, you get the normal right ventricle and left ventricle, but on the right hand, you get the dilated right ventricle, which pushes the interventricular septum towards the left ventricle, which in turn reduces the capacity of the left ventricle. And this shows the relationship between increased pulmonary, in the percentage increase in pulmonary vascular resistance and the partial pressure of oxygen. So this is a very important graph for the people working in the ICU setup. As you can see, when the patient becomes more hypoxic, there will be more pulmonary, pulmonary vascular constriction or hypoxic pulmonary constriction, which results in increased pulmonary vascular resistance which in turn will lead to increased right ventricular workload, ultimately resulting in right ventricular failure. The same happens when the pH rises. So acidosis as well as hypoxia are detrimental to the right ventricle. And this relationship, be this graph shows the relationship between the lung volumes and the pulmonary vascular resistance low lung volumes as well as high lung volumes lead to increased pulmonary vascular resistance depending on the involvement of the extra alveolar vessels or the intra-alveolar vessels. So as you can see, at functional residual capacity, the pulmonary vascular resistance is lowest. So this is very important for us as intensivists because we subject patients to positive pressure ventilation, which results in alternation in pulmonary vascular resistance and which in turn affects the right ventricle. So talking about the main two causes of right ventricle, acute right ventricular failure, either pressure overload or reduced contractility. These are the common causes encountered in the ICU setup 
which leads to pressure overload and acute right ventricular failure. Acidosis, hypoxia, as I explained in the previous graph, acute pulmonary embolism, ARDS, which is applicable to COVID patients as well, and patients who are subjected to positive pressure ventilation and in patients with pericardial disease because of increased pressure in the pericardial cavity. And decreased contractility, sepsis, it's a, one of the most common causes, myocarditis, acute coronary events, and maybe cardiomyopathies. So in terms of evaluation of right heart failure, these are the main four modalities. You can't forget about the history examination and investigations, and you can't forget about the physical examination. So I'm not going to elaborate a lot on physical examination. Then you have the electrocardiographic evaluation, the serum markers, and the echocardiography. So out of these, I assume that most of the people are aware of the physical examination, electrocardiographic evaluation, and serum markers. So I'm just going to elaborate on echocardiography because it's important. I, I won't say that others are not important because it's something which is uh, people are not very familiar with. So with regard to echocardiography, we use the Simpsons method when we want to evaluate the left ventricular volume or the ejection fraction. So because of the circular shape of the uh, left ventricle, we use the Simpsons, Simpsons method in the apical two chamber view, which is shown on the left side, and in the apical four chamber view, which is shown on the right side. So we use of the two, we make use of the two views and uh, measure the left ventricular volume or the ejection fraction. But the problem with the, the right ventricle is because of the shape, we can't apply this rule in evaluating the volume of the right ventricle or the ejection fraction. So because of this reason, we depend on qualitative as well as quantitative measurements to evaluate the right ventricular function. So in terms of uh, the indices used to evaluate right ventricular function, these are the main four uh, indices which is used, which, is, which, which could also be used at bedside echo as intensivists. We measure the right ventricular size, the right ventricular systolic function, the right ventricular systolic pressure, as well as the septal position. So in terms of right ventricular function, qualitative comparison is done and the, right, the normal right ventricle should be two thirds of the left ventricle. We do a bedside echo, look at the four chamber view and just I get an eyeball view and eyeball and say, okay, the normal right ventricle should be two thirds of the left ventricle. This is a qualitative comparison. But we could also do a quantitative comparison where we could measure the diameter of the right ventricle at the base, mid level and the, we could measure the length of the right ventricle as well. And these are the cutoff values. The base, if it is more than 42 millimeters, mid level more than 35 millimeters, and length more than 83 millimeters, tells us that the right ventricle is enlarged. And this is another important measurement, which is frequently mentioned in the 2D, echo 2D echocardiography reports. That's the type tricuspid annular plane systolic exertion. So what we do is we get the four chamber view, which is uh, shown by, by my cursor, and we put the M mode cursor across the tricuspid annulus. So what we do is we see how much the tricuspid annulus moves with systolic contraction of the right ventricle. So when you do the M mode, you can see the M mode like this. So what we do is we measure the excursion of the tricuspid annulus during systole. So the normal value is more than 17 millimeters. The tricuspid annulus should move longitudinally at least 17 millimeters to say that the systolic function is optimal. Then we could measure the right ventricular systolic pressure. So it's uh, the right ventricular systolic pressure is measured using the Bernoulli equation. So what we do is we put the cursor across the uh, tricuspid valve and measure the velocity of the regurgitant jet. So this is the regurgitant jet. So we measure the maximum velocity. And then what we do is we apply the 
uh, velocity to the Bernoulli equation and at the central minus pressure, which is the right rotatory pressure to that, then we could get the right ventricular systolic pressure. So normally the right ventricular systolic pressure should be less than 35 millimeters mercury. So then we move on to the medical management of acute right ventricular failure. So this is a positional statement, which is uh, published by the American Heart Association. So if you could, this is a bit of a complex slide. So if you could uh, appreciate this, they concentrate mainly on few areas. So one of the most important aspects is to diagnose and treat the etiology, to treat the specific cause. If there's a right ventricular myocardial infarction, you have to obviously reperfuse. And if there's pulmonary embolism, then depending on the size, either uh, anticoagulator or of a thrombolytic therapy, or maybe you can offer embolectomy. And the other causes, like sepsis, critical illness, you have to treat the causes appropriately. Treat with antibiotics, make sure the patient is not hypoxic, make sure the patient is not hypercarbic, correct acidosis, because all of these factors will increase the pulmonary vascular resistance and maintain adequate perfusion of the right ventricle. Then of course, you have to exclude pericardial diseases because it can cause pressure overload. Arrhythmias, arrhythmias are detrimental to the right ventricle because sinus rhythm is vital for the perfusion of the right ventricle and for the maintenance of right ventricular output. Then preload optimization. So preload optimization is very important in the context of management of acute right ventricular failure. If you're underfilled, that would be detrimental as well as if you're overfilled, that would also be detrimental. So traditionally, we, were, we are told that we should administer a lot of fluids in the context of right ventricular failure, but it's not the case. If the patient is volume depleted, you should administer small volumes of small boluses very cautiously to make sure the, that the patient is not getting overloaded. So as a guide, you can measure central venous pressure, which shows the, which reflect, reflects the right atrial pressure. Then if the patient is congested, if the JVP is raised, if JVP is elevated, and if there are bibasal creps, and if there's tender hepatomegaly or edema, then you have to think about diuresis. So there is a misconception that if the patient is hypotensive that you can't use diuresis. So what you can do is you can use a vasopressor, bring out the blood pressure and at the same time, carefully diurese the patient using most, most commonly loop diuretics. So in case the patient fails diuresis with medical management, you have to go for early renal replacement therapy. Otherwise you will end up with a failing right ventricle and failing systemic perfusion. Then you have to think about maintenance of perfusion pressure. Even if you optimize the volume, unless the right ventricle is perfused well, you won't be able to maintain the right ventricle function. So one thing is you can bring up the mean arterial pressure using vasopressors, ion probes and perfuse the right ventricle. Other thing is you can reduce the afterload as well to make sure the forward flow of the right ventricle is happening. So for that, you can use either uh, inotropes or inotropes with vasodilated properties. Commonly we use milinone and dobutamine. So in cases of refractory shock where, we, where all these measures fail, then we have to think about acute mechanical circulatory support. So this is the most simplified view of the management of acute right ventricular failure. So in the right side, right hand side, it gives the uh, summary where you identify acute right ventricular failure, you treat you treat the reversible causes, check whether the treatment is successful, and go on monitoring right ventricular function. So uh, the uh, the right hand side just elaborates what I have already told in the previous slide. So this is all I have to say. This is a very concise uh, talk and uh, I, I have not included a lot of evidences. I just wanted to highlight the fact that 
we should not forget about the right ventricle and that we should give equal weightage to the right ventricle as well as the left ventricle thank you very much uh, thank you chamin uh, for that uh, concise uh, talk uh, i think in the future people will look into the forgotten aspect of right ventricle and uh, we have the last speaker who is dr lilanthi subasinga who is a consultant intensivist at national hospital of sri lanka and she is going to talk to us on what is appropriate therapy for critical ill uh, think twice it's an interesting talk and looking forward to hear to that over to you lilanthi thank you dr dilshan for the kind introduction and ccp for giving us this opportunity to present in one of the prestigious forums of ccp thank you dr dilshan again and give that kind introduction and ccp for giving us this opportunity uh, let me share the screen for you first okay so Uh, let's move on to the final topic for the day, which is uh, one of the important topics in critical care. Uh, although we talk about all these evidence and you know everything else, and it matters at the same time, it matters whom should be given all this and whom should be targeted at the end of the day. It is specifically true these days because all of us as treating physicians in the clinical setup, we all would have. Uh, faced a lot of dilemmas in treating end of life patients uh, what to do when to do and where to do so let's move on to some of the facts and tips which would definitely help us in managing these patients so i'm aiming to define the form of end of life care we aim to give to a patient who is in the icu the sri lankan context as intensivists or Uh, healthcare staff involved in intensive care. What we do know at the moment, what we think, and what we do to explore the extent to which the elderly patients and their families are involved in this decision-making process. Basically, whom to receive care, and to understand how patients and their loved ones define the appropriateness of ICU admissions or the higher levels of care we provide. and just to reflect upon the implications of decisions we make during these days especially during the global pandemic so in generic terms what is end of life care for every one of us we know that we have been taught in our medical schools it is basically facilitating a good death especially in a challenged healthcare system like ours is it just merely raising the expectations of age in other words is it one of the quality and quantity standards in healthcare any more and um, well you want to argue that it focuses on that it is the balance between providing the best care for all disregarding the age or frailty versus accepting the inevitability of death at some point of your trajectory it's a difficult task for most of us why we are not being properly trained maybe we have heard about it in our behavioral sciences stream or whatever we are being taught and clinically evaluated during our post graduate period it consists of multiple domains that makes us think twice and think in different ways our view patient's view the family's view the legal framework a lot of things are involved so this is a challenging task for most of us it's basically a concept of concept of shared decision making and providing care with the team especially recognizing and acknowledging the end, this uh, concept in intensive care is very important when you are dealing with critical ill patients it is ethically accepted with all the involvement of pillars of ethics capacity the informed consent associated with legal framework of the local setup and it is context sensitive most of all when we are involving the patients and the family it is very much culture sensitive religion sensitive and lot of social norms to play around especially during the pandemic we have heard lot of stories we have faced lot of lot of scenarios with patients up to now so what what does really matter the quality versus longevity or the quantity of life 
we might have different perspectives as clinicians ourselves or as a patient at one point of our life. So we should be able to see the scenario as a clinician as well as a family member or a patient. So we have to consider all of these factors I have pointed out in deciding what we consider the most to be valuable for one, of one given patient. Is it appropriate to use all the limited resources on one of the failing patients? How do we decide if this, if this patient, the particular patient is failing? The staff's attitude, patient perspective, what they think is the best for them and their expectations when they had capacity. The family's experience, what they expect from us, what they expect the patient to preach at the end of the stay. Both parties, the readiness for shared decision making, is it happening all the time in our setup? Predicted health outcomes of, of a given patient, the trajectory, the ethical framework, not forgetting the legal structure as well, because we are not supported always by the legal structure in the local system. So people come into the ICU just not to go with the same capacity they had before coming into the ICU, they definitely will be left with some form of uh, inability or disability or drawbacks from the ICU care they receive. Dying in the ICU is common. It is a crucial and important aspect in intensive care and we have to, we have, we should be able not, should be able to not forget of that aspect because the mortality is quite high, especially during a global pandemic like this. So who, uh, I mean, what criteria we need to apply when we accept patients for higher levels of care? Have we defined them? After we accept withholding and withdrawal of life prolonging therapy, do we have criteria or do we have any sort of uh, framework or guidance for us to practice in the local clinical setup? We need to think about them or else we have to uh, form our own decision-making uh, protocols. This is much needed in the current day situation in medical, uh, medical world because it has formed to alleviate conflicts and improve satisfaction in patient and families. It should be safe, the care we provide should be compassionate, competent, as well as well ethical. It should promote health and well-being, not to harm the patient. It should encourage and respect informed decision-making of the whole family. And it should preserve dignity, especially in the dying. And you should be accountable for the decisions you make. So where do we stand in our local setup? This is one of the studies we did at National Hospital of Sri Lanka involving all the intensive care units, the health staff involved, the doctors, nurses, as well as the ancillary staff. So what we found, we, we did it to get some insight into what they think, what they perceive as their competence in delivering end-of-life care once the patient is admitted to the ICU. So most of them were quite good in their perceived competence and they had knowledge on delivering symptom management, especially in managing patients in end of life. As well, there was a relationship, a significant one between the medical staff, uh, between the perceived competence with the years of service. So with experience, even though you lack training, you can grab this skill with your experience in dealing with end of life patients. However, we decided that more training, more chances of training should be given to staff in intensive care especially, to take them into higher levels of competence in delivering care to these patients. So this appropriateness of giving the higher levels of care nearing the end of life, does it differ in the COVID-19 pandemic? The basics remain the same. Why do we need to take shared decisions? When, what, and whom should be involved? The inappropriateness or the appropriateness of intensive care for a particular patient depends on the clinician's perception as well as the family or the patient perception. The clinician, as a clinical team, we all judge a patient's trajectory with our clinical judgment and it should be guided by ethical and legal framework, as I mentioned before. 
However, we should not forget the patient perspective. We should seek and dig into their preferences, values, and social constructs. We should not be just on books or theory. We should practice it on a daily basis. This should usually come early in the consultations with the patients, uh, preferably at the outset before the patient comes into the, even into the ICU queue. So you need to discuss with the patient and family prior to admission as a team of intensive care, uh, health staff. You should educate the capacitous patients on the outcomes of life, sustaining therapies, depending on the severity of their illness. That is the basic framework. Does it differ in pandemics? Yes, we have a lot of obstacles. It is a new disease, which scares predictive information about the disease or the trajectory of different age groups. It is a difficult burden on doctors. They have to make very unpleasant choices on rationing access to the ICU, not the usual norms. It demands a lot of life-saving therapies, which exceeds the supply, especially in countries like us. And the triage of treatment for ICU, whom should be taken in or not, it is usually guided by evidence-based protocols in a growing pandemic uh, situation, plus the prognostic checklists as we get to know the enemy uh, as the days flow. However, the principles of shared decision-making, we should not change, but it needs to be altered according to the resources we have, the likely outcomes, the likelihood of benefit of those treatment options we offer to the patients, as well as the family and patients' willingness to accept the risks we, the interventions pose at the end of life, especially. So we need to, we must have a lead time at the outset to discuss about ceilings of care, which we don't do usually, uh, depending on the severity. When we see uh, our admissions, especially among the elderly, to the hospital or to the ICU, we know that from the beginning, the outcomes remain poor. They might not survive the admission. They might not survive until the ICU admission, death, death within months of discharge. And even among the ICU survivors, there could be severely compromised long-term quality of life in many. What do they need? Do we know? Do we ask them? They think high quality of end of life in the ICU as encompassing timely and compassionate communication. They need us to talk to them. It's really, really sad that we don't do this in the normal situation itself. So shared decision making, they think it's a must to evaluate patient treatment goals and values. They think we should avoid prolongation of dying and we should preserve comfort and dignity. This is through qualitative evidence, especially done before the pandemic. So I, I'm pretty sure that patients accept this to some extent, even in our context. Natural dying in the ICU, do we medicalize it? We give all the advanced life prolonging tests we have and try to grab him for a further day or two. This is the real need. If you talk to the nurse who is at the bedside, is, this the is that the real need of that nursing officer? Is that the real need for the patient or family? It should be right in the aspects, but we need to dig into their feelings and decisions as well. So what do we think as clinicians? There is no consensus of inappropriateness or we can't apply the same criteria to all the situations or all the ICU setups or all the institutions. However, we need to act in the best interest of the patient by default. In one of the qualitative studies done among the clinicians who are attending the critically ill uh, during the pandemic situation, it was found that we think the following to be medically inappropriate. The intensity of resource was deemed more substantial than warranted. I mean, we can't provide what they need because the intensity is more substantial than what we have already. The patient is too ill to benefit from ICU. Little hope for survival following the ICU stay. And the interventions, the interventions are negligible to impact on recovery of independence of the patient as a whole. 
as well some interventions might have adverse outcomes on health and quality of life on the, of the patient so do we think before do we practice this practically do we know what patients and surrogates want and the legal background who should take the lead and who should take the final decision yes it is the clinician but I always have to think who who else should i get involved what do patients and family perception what is the patient and family perception on this many during many of the qualitative studies they have found too much treatment is inappropriate which is against their wishes which poses the patient into unacceptable suffering and as well costly futile treatment nothing to look forward to vegetable state these are the words used by the families waste of time and money uh, it was found that this perceived inappropriateness of the family is going hand in hand with the lack of satisfaction of them with icu care we provide this can go in two different ways one group may think it is futile why do you use why do why do you think about it on him this is really clearly seen in western setup where they come and argue with you where they come and come up with their genuine thoughts about what they think about the patient as well there could be a group who thinks the aggressive treatment is preferred over palliation and this thought is associated with high satisfaction which way should we go should we always give them the preference or should we come to a conclusion so futile end of life interventions are basically low treatments with low likelihood of treatment success limited expected effect on patients quality of life and quantity of life as well some part to be played by anticipated emotional and financial cost so we have to come to a conclusion we should share our ideas about the patient we should discuss together come to a conclusion and agree on the plan ahead withdrawal and withholding of treatment is one of the main aspects once the patient who is inappropriate for icu care is received into the icu when there is no true prospect of benefit and the and or there is a possibility of causing harm is it really uh, a love dinner setup we have to talk we have to talk about it who are involved the treating team including the doctors the nursing staff the patient the family if the patient doesn't have close family the surrogates timing as i told you earlier it should be on admission and two hours required it should be pre decided and communicated then and there to the patient so what to talk during the discussions these three points i found it really useful in clinical practice how to start how to go on give them the opportunity and take a decision and especially uh, decide on another time to meet up and this i mean whenever they need us, they, they need to talk to us we have to give them opportunity so pro prognosis or the trajectory should be decided by should be presented to the relative and the uh, patient without any hidden agendas their past medical history their current condition the severity where do we think he would end in couple of days at least and provide facts on treatment goals we plan to provide is it a curative intention palliative or terminal care not only the negative prognostic info but if we have positive aspects we have to provide the information directly we always have to seek patient's best interest it could be through patient a capacitor patient advanced directives lasting power of attorney most of these would not be practiced in our local setup however we need to know that these stuff exists helping us legally let them ask questions let them accept our suggestions or let them oppose or decline options breathe create group come again in the afternoon and we'll have a chat where do we go wrong in this process i would take psychological distress and anxiety 
as the topmost because both parties are distressed anxious sometimes we might be unprepared for decision making at this minute as clinicians we might lack experience of in talking to these sort of relatives there could be difficult situations to manage some unsuccessful strategies we need to revise what to say again when we meet so in one of the qualitative studies it was found in few of the in one of the uh, summated uh, studies including both quantitative and qualitative it was found that inconsistent with parent patient and family values was one of the most important factors which uh, the patient the patient side thought led to inappropriate icu care as well lack of consultation with patient and lack of control by family led to dissatisfaction but in their perspective it's true but it has not to be their decision it should be our decision along with what they think so the norm should be you should empower people and the families to make choices about their own health they can't ask for treatment but we can they can decline treatment we are the ones uh, who should share this information and get into a common path the earlier they receive information is the best so the pandemic we are facing all these these days massive escalation of patient load what to do shall we escalate this patient or not we don't have much resources what we have is going down it's it's, it's very scarce it's a matter of urgency we have to make these decisions quite in a haste and end of life discussions have should happen more frequently than ever before so what is our role we should help families understand the aims of limitation of treatment most of our families in the local setup when we talk to them they are really really acceptable i mean they are very they are very uh, they accept they are very uh, uh, they they expect us to talk to them and they are very flexible in making decisions and discuss potential futility of aggressive treatment if they think that is the best you should consider appropriate ceilings of care according to patient's needs values preferences have some lead time always there is li limited visitors the fact of limited visitors to the hospital so you always tend to connect the patient and families with your discussions through whatever the link you have so just the guidance for the criteria of icu admissions discharge and triage in the pandemic situations just to think of lot of stuff and not just age not just severity not just predicted benefit during and after the icu stay you have to think a lot and take a shared decision i know we like time but we have to take at least few steps to make sure that these factors are addressed so as i said before the demand for life saving resources the exceeding supply so possible need to make unwanted choices of rationing access to the icu uh should be minimized by discussions pandemic triage it's one of the new terms we have come across it is different then the usual triage because of the resource limitation and the survival is strictly diminished once resources are exhausted especially in critical patients no guidelines are available at the interim which could be applied to all setups there could be some checklists which you can follow so suggestions how to triage for icu multi principal allocation framework it's one of the practice strategies which mainly depends on scale of emergency drawbacks loss of patient autonomy they want to they want the treatment but we don't have if it's only an emergency or if we can treat the emergency and save life we take into the icu and loss of dignity we don't really respect their wishes so even in this setup there should be an opportunity to reach satisfactory negotiation between clinicians and patients 
the two perspectives should come together always. So way forward, what, what can we do to make ourselves and them happy? Consult before ICU admission, obtain consent for whatever the treatment plan you're offering, guided and continuous communication updates, sufficient time for information exchange, consistent information. So one should always be there. One of the treating team, one of the persons should be there always. The role of each care provider should be addressed, and identified and communicated to them. Early and proactive palliative care, which is very important in dying patient. This is one of the frameworks suggested by one of the studies in the triage system. When the, when the patient is willing. So the, first, the, so the first thing we need to see is what patient thinks is the best. And then the resources. And then the triage tool, if you have one, considering all these facts. Uh, so the triage tool, and then if he meets all the inclusion criteria, you tend to enter the patient into a time-limited queue to wait for the ICU. But if you think the patient, even if the pay, these tools should allow the most appropriate patient to be in the ICU. So you need to add the patients at the clinician's perspective somewhere top. When the patient is not willing to go into the ICU or receive higher levels of care after the discussions we have, you can try palliation if you also agree. And uh, provide him with the best palliation or the end of life care at a different setup. So what are the implications to routine practice, our last aim? Medical criteria alone will put the patients and us in ethical dilemmas of overlooking patient values and preferences. So we always, always have to involve the families and patient. However, the time constraints and everything we have, I mean, we are, we are, we are short of staff, we are short of time, we are short of uh, uh, resources, or we are, we are short of a lot of stuff at this critical period of time. So it is not really tested or proven in pandemic situations. However, we, we should try to put the basics ahead. Finally, perceived inappropriateness of ICU care is multifactorial. You need to address everything possible. Social constructs go beyond medical rationale at times. So you need to respect the social norms and patients' beliefs beyond your medical thinking. There is consistent discordance on perception between the healthcare user and the healthcare provider. So you need to balance the two aspects. Need to consider their values. The best thing is early communication, which is a must for shared decision making at the outset. You need to uh, act upon news, act on or use new strategies to come to conclusions, especially in a pandemic. Develop a triage tool based on emergency need and patient values incorporating our thinking of the trajectory, which will assist clinicians in different setups. So patient values, expected outcomes, according to our thinking, and com competing priorities for ICU services because we lack resources. So these three things should come hand in hand with early shared decision making to take the most appropriate into the ICU bed. Thank you. Thank you, Janti. And uh, now the question and answer session, but uh, we didn't receive any of the questions and answer session uh, online. And uh, Dilshan, would you like to ask any questions? Uh, there's one question. Uh... Uh, I think this relates to ARDS. Uh, in ARDS, when we rest the lung with low tidal volumes, the chances of uh, carbon dioxide going up is high. Do we need to keep the partial pressure of carbon dioxide less than 45 always in COVID? I think Anushka can answer this. Yeah. Um, 
So this um, carbon dioxide rise is mostly seen in the context of COVID. What we experience is not in the uh, L type, it's in the H type where there is uh, uh, there's low compliance and low recruitability of the, the high recruitability of the lung and the lung is now quite wet. We cannot uh, ventilate them enough. So, uh, but at the same time, the lung protective ventilation protocols tells us to avoid um, further trauma from the ventilator, that is ventilator-induced lung injury, to uh, ventilate them at a low tidal volume. So the uh, recommendation is 6 ml per kg. Uh, and uh, also at the same time, we have to measure the um, plateau pressures and the driving pressures. Those are the pressure values they give. They tell us to keep the pressure values less than these numbers to avoid the pressure trauma to the lung. But when we do this, this affects the minute ventilation. So minute ventilation is, um, uh, is uh, uh, what, uh, in, inversely proportionate to the carbon dioxide. So we, when we reduce the minute ventilation, carbon dioxide goes up. So that's the question here. And uh, so this, uh, what, what is the limit of carbon dioxide that we can accept? So 45 is the normal level, 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury is the normal level of carbon dioxide. But when we do less minute ventilation, it will go up sometimes 60, 70, up to 90 even. That is called high permissive hypercapnia. We allow that. So we think it, it has its own uh, problems, set of problems, but we allow it because the problem of ventilated induced lung injury is more than the hypercapnia, the transient hypercapnia at that time. So we will get, uh, we will, but still we look at the pH. If the pH is maintained we are less than, uh, more than 7.2, we allow the carbon dioxide to go up. It's not the value of the carbon dioxide that we are aiming, it is the pH. But if it goes further down, less than 7.2, because the carbon dioxide is building up, then we, unfortunately, we have to go up. The respiratory rate, of course, we can increase up to 30. Maintaining the IE ratio, that is the expiratory time of two seconds, yeah, of one is to two. Inspiratory time one to expiratory time two, we can go up on the respiratory up to a maximum of 30. And even still, if the carbon dioxide is building up, we might have to go the increase the tidal volume. It's not 6 ml, then we might have to go up to 7 ml, sometimes even up to 8 ml. But make sure your plateau pressures and your pressure levels are kept within the, uh, the uh, safe uh, range. So in very, very severe ARDS, even in COVID, sometimes the pH goes below 7.2, the carbon dioxide is around 90, and uh, the pressures have gone sky high, and uh, that is an indication of poor prognosis. It's very unlikely that those patients will uh, respond. And uh, um, even proning, the proning helps in oxygenation, but most of the time it does not help in my experience in carbon dioxide removal. So uh, rise in carbon dioxide is a bad, like kind of a indicator uh, of a bad outcome. And I would like to add one thing now. You mentioned about the fluid, the liberal versus conservative management uh, in ARDS. Now, I think in the early, uh, early part of the pandemic, especially in the first wave, they tried to get them negative and to dry the lungs by, you know, diuresing. Uh, but then they uh, came up with a problem of acute renal injury, uh, creatinine is going sky high. So uh, now in, in uh, ARDS patients, especially related to COVID, what do you recommend on the fluid strategy in these patients who are going into ARDS? Do you make them, you know, negative or do you make them conservative or do you sort of give liberal fluids? Yeah, now the COVID ARDS and the, uh, the COVID uh, pneumonia and the, uh, the conventional ARDS differ in this manner, in this context, because in the early or the, uh, um, the L type uh, uh, COVID pneumonia, what happens, the hypoxemia is mainly due to a VQ mismatch. That is uh, the, the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. That is a protective mechanism. When there's low oxygen in the lung, the pulmonary vasculature constricts, so it reduces the VQ mismatch. But in COVID, what they have noted is this, this mechanism is not functioning. So the, the pulmonary vasculature remains dilated. Uh, as a result, there is going to be hypoxia because the blood is, uh, the, there is no oxygenation, but the blood is flowing through. So there's a shunt that is going up. 
So uh, in this context, giving oxygen and uh, um, may, may, might help. But if we reduce the fluid intake, what happens is that because of the vasoplegia, that there is reduced uh, right-sided cardiac output that will go further go down. And as a result, the hypoxia may worsen. So in the early part of COVID pneumonia, you actually have to hydrate them very well. So we do not go for a restrictive uh, uh, fluid uh, management in early COVID pneumonia. But once they go into ARDS, severe ARDS, that is with a heavy lung, with the uh, congestion, at that, that point, uh, you might actually go for a neutral or even restrictive balance. But in the, at the same time, if they go, they develop pulmonary embolism and have pulmonary thrombos, again, you, might, you cannot go for a restrictive uh, fluid uh, management because then it will increase the thrombosis risk. So it's a, it's a very kind of difficult kind of a uh, fluid management. It's completely different from the conventional ARDS. So you have to go like a point of care management. You have to do IVC uh, uh, assessment, CVP assessment, and uh, the right heart assessment and do all that to manage fluid. So I can't say go for liberal or restrictive or uh, so on. It all depends on that patient. You have to assess the patient and give the fluid. I hope I made myself clear. Yeah, so thank you. Anushka, I, I would like to ask uh, Nuan a question. Now, uh, you talked about phenotypes, uh, different, different phenotypes. Now, we see a lot of heterogeneity among, especially among the COVIDs. Now, have they come up with, uh, you know, uh, identifying these different phenotypes, uh, considering the biomarkers or anything? Who, who you know, who, what sort of biomarkers uh, will tend to predict that the outcome is going to be good? Or what biomarkers will tend to predict uh, the, the, the progression is good or the progression is not bad? Uh, have they identified uh, uh, those sort of phenotypes by looking at the biomarkers? Uh, actually, Dirishan, uh, the thing is uh, regarding the COVID acid, I think sepsis, uh, whatever the studies that they have mentioned, is uh, like uh, they were kind of failed to identify one single biomarker to identify the uh, uh, this uh, uh, prognosis. But rather, it's a kind of a collective uh, uh, collective uh, uh, inference they made through the uh, this inflammatory markers, this uh, CRP. Uh, this uh, interleukin levels, interleukin 6, interleukin 10, and all those uh, that in, in combination, uh, they showed that higher the inflammatory markers, higher the uh, uh, inflammatory status and cytokine status of the body, the poor the prognosis. But uh, they have failed to uh, uh, identify one single particular uh, uh, biomarker and a specific cutoff. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a spectrum uh, with a, a collective decision involving all the inflammatory markers, and then they come up with uh, the uh, uh, idea that higher the inflammatory status of the patient, uh, poor the prognosis, and higher the mortality. We have another question. Uh, this, uh, this question is so pretty common, especially to COVID, uh, the patient, people who are managing COVID. A lot of anxiety among medics uh, to intubate COVID ARDS or COVID hypoxemia. And there is a thought uh, that the intubated patients won't survive or don't do well. Uh, what's your opinion? I would like to ask this from Anushka, who is managing COVID. Um, yeah, it's um, now what we've been told from the West is that early intubation is in, in patients who are uh, having a high respiratory drive. This is because they cause uh, self-inflicted lung injury. They, they, have, they are hypoxic. So what they do is they take a very large minute volumes uh, to compensate that. So they can take more oxygen inside. So they generate very large tidal volumes. When that, uh, they, that stretch on that alveolus will make the, the as I uh, uh, explained earlier, there's a pathophysiology, a cytokine being released that will be further uh, increased with this uh, self-inflicted lung injury. So what they uh, told us was to intubate these patients so that injury will stop at that point. So uh, the, the patient gets bad either because the COVID pneumonia gets worse or because there is self-inflicted lung injury. By intubating them, we stop that self-inflicted lung injury. So the COVID, only the COVID pneumonia will progress from that point onwards. Uh, so 
uh, theoretically as well as practically in the Western world, that is true. Even even in our country, I think the self-inflicted lung injury is happening. But uh, what happens is, in our settings, our um, uh, there are other problems of intubation. What we what I have and you must have also, when we intubate these patients, we have uh, um, infections very high risk of uh, VAP being developed. And uh, then uh, there are um, pra practical problems like uh, our setting, our resources, our nursing staff, our doctors, how we go in to look in these patients is different from what the West is doing. And so there are inadvertent uh, events, critical events that happen. And uh, so many other things that will come into the play. So what happens altogether is uh, unlike their patients, our percentage of patients who survive after intubation is much less, I think. I don't think we have uh, actual numbers, but from the experience that I have gathered from uh, our colleagues as well as from uh, the Western countries, I feel our, our, our uh, outcome is, is less compared to uh, them. These are because of the secondary tell, complications. It doesn't tell you uh, that not to intubate, isn't it? No, it doesn't. No, 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 it doesn't. It doesn't. We just have to improve our other basic infrastructure and our uh, infection control modes and all that has to improve a lot uh, if we are targeting that uh, type of a mortality reduction. Thank you, Anushka. I think we don't have any further questions. Uh, Shamit, yeah. shall we wind up? Yes. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians, uh, I would like to thank all the four speakers. Uh, but unfortunately, we are unable to hand over the uh, certificates of appreciation. We will hand over later on. And uh, Dilshan Priyankar, the president of the College of uh, Critical Care Specialist. And uh, thank you, Dilshan, for uh, joining with us with the Ceylon College of Physicians. Uh, this month is the Critical Care Medicine Month. And uh, we had uh, three exciting programs. Uh, uh, basically, today is the last one, and we had the, the college lecture as well as the expert webinar, and uh, and uh, also the um, thank you very much, Dilshan, and the college. Uh, you are the youngest college and joining with us uh, in our sister colleges. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, the usual audiovisual team. And uh, before winding up, uh, there's an announcement I have to make. Uh, I have to make that uh, the Ceylon College of Physicians, uh, we are holding our annual academic sessions for the 2021 uh, from the 2nd to 4th of September. And uh, this conference is a fully virtual conference and uh, with the collaboration of the Royal College of Physicians London and also uh, with the collaboration of the Royal College of Physicians uh, Edinburgh. And uh, on the 2nd, we are having the pre-Congress and the 3rd and 4th of September that we are having the main sessions. And uh, we are having a very exciting program and uh, most of the world-renowned uh, speakers uh, will be joining with us and uh, in various uh, topics and specialties. And uh, uh, yeah, finally, uh, I would like to invite all of you to get registered. The closing date for this session, uh, either for the annual academic sessions of the Zero College of Physicians on 31st of August at 4 p.m. Uh, until that time, you can be get registered. And I'm cordially invite all of you to get registered uh, before that and give this message to all your colleagues, the societies, organizations, colleges, and everybody. And uh, it's uh, full of exciting and very informative and a uh, lot of uh, about COVID-19 infections and the other relevant uh, topics as well. So finally, I would like to thank uh, all the Nuan Ranavaka, the coordinator of this session and uh, the whole program and also the our audiovisual team for, for their continuous support and including the support given to our annual, annual academic sessions. Thank you so much and hope to join you with the annual academic sessions on the 2nd to 4th of September uh, in the coming uh, few days. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shamita, yes. for us this opportunity. And I would like to thank the Ceylon College of Physicians as well as the, uh, the speakers who took their valuable time uh giving valuable um, opinion and a message to the uh, the trainees or the uh, the, the medical uh, people so and uh, uh, as chamita said i think hopefully uh, there will be a lot of participants for the annual sessions 
and i would like to thank the attendees as well uh, thank you very much